Thank you, Jane. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, oh, we've missed one. Uh, as uh, as DJ said, I'm Melissa. I'm a fractional chief product officer, and uh, and what that means is I I kind of work part time for a bunch of different companies, helping their exec teams with specific strategic challenges. Um, my background: I've I've worked in tech for probably about 28 years, and started in UX uh, and and product really, and. Um, moved, sort of um, moved into leadership and product leadership in about 2007 um, at the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, uh, where I had to take my first role as a manager of digital product development in their digital business team in their commercial division. Uh, since then, I've, I've done a whole bunch of other things, uh, but I want to talk today about the journey of going from being a UX kind of a person to needing to really lift my game in a commercial um, organisation and where I had to make decisions that, uh, that had a financial outcome. And, uh, and what I've noticed working with product managers over the last, you know, sort of 15 years is that there's, there are, there's a lot of responsibility put on this role and not everybody necessarily really understands the basics and don't, doesn't necessarily know how to make um, choices that, uh, that have involved thinking about the maths. So as a, as a person who came from UX, and when I arrived into this first uh, manager product development role and I had to, to put together my first P&L and, and my first product forecast, it, I felt a little bit like this. It was pretty scary. And, um, uh, you know, I want to make sure that other people don't feel this way. And so this is why we're going to talk about building commercial acumen today. You don't need to have undies on the outside to build commercial acumen. Um, there may be a lot of you in the room who um, who do already know how to do forecasting and you know how to think about the unit economics of your customers' business models, and that's fantastic. Um, this is a bit of a, I guess, a checkup for, um, for everybody so that we're starting with first principles and a few scrappy tools. So the first thing... And this probably will look very familiar to you. As a product manager, you're kind of responsible for wrangling all the things and making sure that you've hit customer desirability, uh, feasibility from both a technical perspective, but also an operational perspective. Can, can you operate it? And then also there's the business angle, which is about, is it viable for the business? And uh, can you make, uh, you know, is it is it profitable and is it sustainable? And the sort of inputs to what viability is is, is sort of probably twofold strategy, data, and then a bunch of crunching numbers. Just quickly, why execs get twitchy about ROI when you've got things in your backlog and you might get asked, um, how is this how is this um, driving value for the company? is because of that little purple line as it goes um, as it goes down. When your company's making choices about what to invest in, that, that little bit below the black line there is opportunity cost for anything else you might be doing. And so that's one of the reasons why um, getting to grips with the numbers and how the product choices that you are making might impact on, on both top line revenue, but also cash over time is, is a good way to be thinking about it when you're also trying to serve customers and their needs. Um, one of the, the concepts that I actually didn't come across at all until I um, uh, co-founded my own startup was this idea of Tam, Sam and Som. Is, is, this a, is this a term that many of you are familiar with? Pop your hands up. A yeah, few, few of you, got, oh yeah, probably half the room. Um, total addressable market, serviceable available market, and um, serviceable obtainable market. This, um, this is a super useful framework. When I first started using it, I thought that TAM meant literally the size of the entire sector. And it actually, I've popped up the link, um, and I'm sure we'll see the, share these slides afterwards, to a, a good little explainer. Um, 
it, it took a while to, for me to figure out actually that TAM is the number of companies or customers that are in your market that are going to pay you your historic price. And um, uh, and if you don't have a historic price, then you're probably going to need to do a, a thumbs up to get there. The other thing that I think um, that I've sort of talked to product teams about a little bit um, when thinking about how much to polish the product you're working on is what level of, um, what, what, sorry, what is the business stage your product is at? Um, there's, uh, you know, um, engineering teams in particular often want to make sure they're building things once and they're doing it so that it can handle scale. And that is a laudable um, uh, thing to want um, because we've all been bitten before by tech debt. But sometimes when you're getting started on something and you might be, you know, before, you know, you're, you're at, you don't know if a customer is going to want something, then doing the scrappy thing at the beginning um, is... Uh, it might be the thing to do. And then once you've proven that, then you can start putting some more effort in behind it. Uh, one of the principles, I think, for product managers who want to build their commercial acumen um, is to learn in the open. There's nothing like um, actually announcing that you, you want to, um, to lift your understanding of the financials in your company. And what you'll find when you do that is that people who do know about that stuff will come and help you. And, um, and learning in the open gives, puts a bit of accountability behind it as well. And, um, and you can then actually create a bit of a learning community about it too. Finance people are people too. Um, go make friends. I, um, I have regularly um, made trips to the finance team's place and the organisations I've worked for. These are real, actual finance people who've helped me in my career. Um, Cheryl Scroop was the financial controller at the ABC and she, um, she helped me build my first um, P&Ls and, and uh, product forecasts. Um, Gordon used to be in strategic finance at TVNZ and when I was coaching their PM team, he, um, he put together a bit of a course for them on how to think about strategic finance and how to, um, how to think about product P&Ls and, um, and really sort of, you know, lift, lift what they were doing there. And then Danny is the CFO at Story Park and um, I, he, uh, he understands product deeply and was a brilliant person to, to work with. Nobody is expecting perfection. I think, you know, again, one of the things that um, I didn't understand when I first started really trying to build my financial acumen um, back in the ABC days was that maths is, you know, there is a, there's a right answer often in maths. But actually, when you talk to accountants who are putting together models for you, the... Um, Sorry, uh, the you know the a thumb suck is actually okay. But having a believable set of numbers where you make some assumptions that are based on the market and what you've learned about that market is completely fine, and um, and it is often and an, an sort of finding your way there uh, with the numbers. Um, so a good place to start uh, is with the costs of your initiatives. Um, what is it actually going to cost for your squad, you know, whether that's seven people, um, uh, to, you know, to, to produce the thing that you, uh, you want to make? And um, a really easy way to break that down is a typical uh, squad costs, you know, you can either take it on $100,000 a month or a million dollars a year. And then from there, you can pretty much go, okay, well, if the team has sized this at you know, it's a, a large, and that a large means it's nine months, or, you know, a small means it's it's under it's a month or less. Then you can really start to get a sense of actually what is the cost, um, and therefore the opportunity cost of that initiative, and compare it to other things um, that you might be doing. Hat tip to Danny. Um, he introduced the scruffy napkin calc at Story Park when I was there as chief product officer. And uh, we, um, he, he did it, I can't forget what piece of product he did it for, but he just um, started doing some noodling in an Excel sheet. And 
Uh, and it struck me that you don't always need to have a really full-on commercial model to to get going and to get a sense of what's the contribution your piece of product is going to be making to the um, to the overall success of the company. Um, and so, uh, you know, actually, this is incredibly ugly. I I actually figured out there are 1.6 million dentists worldwide. Did you know that? Um, and in New Zealand, there are 3,500 dentists and 5,000 um, dental staff. And then I made it up on the on the endodontists. But however you drive Excel, and everybody is different, figure out a way to just like stick some calcs in there and just do um, 10 minutes of playing around because that often um, can help you make a choice between one product decision or another product decision. Price is product two. Um, it, who's familiar with Van Western Dorp? This is, um, this is an awesome tool for price testing. And the thing that I like about it is that the sorts of questions you ask customers are very similar to any other user research question that you might ask. But if you plug those questions into a, a little model, then what you're going to end up with is a nice little chart that gives you an acceptable price range at the end of it. And, um, and so this is, you know, at the point that you've got a product that you want to put in front of people and you're wondering how to price it, this is an excellent tool to get going. You got this. I did a super, this, I, did I finish super early? <laughs> you totally got this. Um, but if you'd like help, um, my, one thing I was going to say is, imagine you had a CPO in your pocket working for you. I want to try doing a little something where I'm thinking about putting together a course or group coaching sessions. And so if you might be interested in that, um, snap the QR code. I've got a little survey there. And um, I would love to uh, get your feedback in a sense of what might be useful. Thank you very much, everyone. And I will now hand over to Anthony. All right, so a couple of things I forgot to say at the start. We're going to do a combined Q&A um, after my talk, so hold your questions till then. Um, if you're online, and you can always forget to say this as well, um, please put your questions into the chat. We'll pick them up from there. Feel free to drop your questions as we go along. Right. Um, okay, so what am I going to talk about? Escaping the product owner trap. Um, stuff that I wish I knew 10 years ago. And as I've said this to a few people tonight, um, this is a bit of a catharsis for me because it's conversations that I've had individually with people over the last couple of years, both about stuff that I really wish I knew 10 years ago, um, but also stuff that now that I've moved into an executive role recently, stuff that I wish um, people working with executives would know. First, who am I? Um, so I'm Anthony Marta. Hello. I always forget to introduce myself. I'm currently Chief Product Officer at Solar Zero. Um, one thing, I'm actually going to be stepping out of that role, moving back into consulting at the end of this month. Um, if anything I say tonight resonates, I will have some time on my hands to be able to help you with it. So if you're interested in getting some, some more help, um, chat with me afterwards. Uh, that's my LinkedIn profile there, the QR code. I promise it's not a Rick roll. Um, and I'm also organizer, one of the organizers for Product Tank Auckland and the chair of Product Aotearoa. Uh, Product Aotearoa, we'll talk about this at the end, we're the organization who brings together product people across New Zealand. It's our passion about trying to build the craft and help everybody learn and grow together across the entire country. Uh, we are looking at doing another conference and DJ will talk more about that at the end, which is really exciting. But what am I here to talk about? Well, you heard what Melissa has just told you. and. But what I want to talk about is, is how do you actually make this real in your organization? How do you actually go from, you know, say, I want to develop commercial acumen. What does that actually mean? So when I'm interviewing product managers, um, when I'm talking to product managers or product owners, and I will do this subtly, so now you know what I'm asking you, is that I'm trying to figure out in the overall scope of Marty Kagan's perfect product manager, where do you sit? What are your what are your skill sets? You know, how much are you across these different areas are you actually involved in? Every organization does this differently, by the way. So there is no right or wrong answer to this. But what I find, and particularly in New Zealand and Australia, is that a lot of people are trapped in this area. Or generally in delivery, it's where I came from. I started off as a product owner. 
I come from engineering background, so I have no financial accounting background. Um, and you're stuck in this delivery build kind of world. Maybe you start to get involved in discovery and you get a little bit involved in go to, you know, some of the, the mechanical aspects of go to market. But you kind of, you're there. And how do you get out of that? And one of the reasons why I really wanted to do this talk tonight, particularly in the context of um, the stuff that Brian Chesky has been talking about, the whole Airbnb, like, do we really need product managers? This is actually starting to become a little bit of an existential threat to people with that product owner title. As organizations look and go, what value are you adding to the organization? If you are just administering a backlog, is that really adding value? Is that something like mean, AI could do it? Is it something that can be automated and whatnot? Organizations, you know, you know, we are in this historic downturn in tech. I've, you know, I've been around a very long time. This is kind of the worst that I've seen it. Um, and so organizations really have this focus on cost. So this is a little bit existential, which is why I wanted to do this talk tonight, because I want to help people get out of that trap and find out that there's actually much more to life. How can you move into those other areas, you know, from, from business or product strategy, you know, if you're a single product company, your product strategy and your business strategy are, are intertwined with each other. The pricing stuff that Melissa was just talking about, I was a little bit concerned that when um, she talked about the Von Westrop, um, Von Westendorf, sorry, pricing method, there are only another couple of people. Please learn that. It's a really interesting technique. Works well. Um, you know, discovery and delivery, a lot of us get involved in that. That's kind of standard kind of stuff. But the, the more the marketing side of go-to-market and then the optimization and growth beyond that. And then sitting underneath that, competitor analysis, roadmaps, and positioning. And so when I'm talking about commercial acumen, what I'm talking about is generally the stuff that I've circled there in grey. That's what I, what I, in my mind, is the commercial stuff or the business stuff. You know, when we like to talk about the business, um, that's the stuff that they do. Again, every organisation is different. You know, you will find that there would be, you know, your organisation might choose to do strategy in a strategy team. I don't I think that's a good thing, but that's just my opinion, but that might be what works for your particular organization. Sorry, Sue, Sue and I were talking about this earlier on. <laughs> um, and I want you to ask, well, if I want to develop more commercial acumen, why? How is this going to actually help my organization? This is really important. There is no point you going, I really want to get involved in XYZ if that's not actually going to add value to your organization. It's quick, quickest way to end up exiting out the door. Um, but there are a lot of really valid reasons for doing this. Um, and to be honest, like one of the reasons why I um, was asked to join Solar Zero originally was that um, they basically they had a founder and their CEO who were swamped. And they, and they really started to think, well, how can we actually delegate out? You know, they were doing all the product stuff and all the strategy and whatnot. How could they delegate that out to more people? And I was talking about, okay, this is what a product manager should actually do. And this was really, it was a really interesting conversation because at that time they had a couple of product owners. And what I was talking about in terms of what a product manager does was not, very much not what those product owners were doing. They're like, what do you mean, Anthony? Like, that's not what we hear from our people. And this is the catch-22 of the situation, is that if you are a product owner and um, you're working for someone who really doesn't understand that full spectrum of product management, they do not know what this, this full sort of spectrum of product management actually means. So you have to help them to understand. And helping them to understand is some of these points. Here. There can be a whole lot of other reasons as well. This is what I just quickly brainstormed the other night when I was putting this presentation together. It might be that succession planning. You know, the founder at some point is going to want to take, take a step back and want somebody to take their baby. Um, Getting more customer oriented. How do we get these teams who are only in the delivery side more connected to our customers? How can we, you know, everyone talks about being customer oriented, customer focused. I call bullshit on a lot of them because actually their teams are nowhere near connected to the customers. So how can you be customer oriented if that's not the case? Um, removing dependencies in your organization. How do you get more into a value stream way of working so you're not in constantly managing dependencies? That's a killer for a lot of organizations. Um, it's really hard to measure the performance of a product person if it isn't actually connected to a product metric or a financial metric. I've you know, spent a lot of time creating um, product uh, so OKRs for product people as individuals, how you know their, their role, their KPIs and whatnot that they need to achieve. It's really, really, really hard unless you can actually tie it to a commercial objective for the product. So it enables you to, to be able to better measure your own role or if you're a leader, better measure the performance of your people. Flow and effectiveness. Um, if you're constantly hitting the boundaries of your organization, particularly in that delivery mode, you're constantly bumping up against the strategy people or the go-to-market people and whatnot, 
that's not fun. You're not in a flow state. You're not able to flow that product right the way through from sort of like why are we doing this and what's it worth to us through to actually seeing it in the market and figuring out whether or not we're earning that market. You know, to me, that's the the flow, the ideal flow state for me personally as a product person as I enjoy, you know, figuring out something that might be really cool and then launching it to find out if it was as cool as I thought it was. And then overall commercial success. You know, there are a lot of organizations where if they're, if they're really stuck, you know, we, we talk about feature factories and all that kind of stuff. If they're stuck in that mode, they can be drifting way off product market fit and they haven't realized it yet. And unless you've got somebody who can see that bigger commercial picture, who's focusing on the overall picture, it can be really hard to miss. And if that person doesn't have a voice around the executive table, you can get stuck and that will kill the company. But again, there is no right or wrong answer to all of this. You need to figure out what works for your organization. Why do you actually want to develop this commercial acumen? How will it help your organization? And then be able to sell it, sell that to a team leader. And you need to build trust as well. So it comes back to that story I was telling about, you know, in the early days when I was engaging with Solar Zero, is that their product owners were not trusted to have these conversations. And I've learned a lot about trust working for an organization. We, we do solar. Um, solar is something you either spend $20,000 on or we, in, in our subscription product, you commit to a 25-year contract. Um, and that's a trust thing. Like, yeah, you have to actually build trust with your customers. The same applies to you internally. And this, again, I've, I've seen a lot of product people come unstuck this way. They're like, I'm talking about this stuff. It's really, really, really important. But why is nobody listening to me? It's because you haven't built that trust yet. And trust comes in two forms. Reputation. Do they know your background outside of the organization? You know, when I started there, I was fortunate that some, I had some strong recommendations for some people of what my reputation was, so my voice was trusted. Or experience. Have they seen you do it? And that, that, then you get in that, stuck in that an awkward kind of catch-22 is that if you don't have the opportunity to talk about commercial stuff, you can't demonstrate that you can be trusted with that. And you have to find a way to kind of break out of that cycle because your leaders are looking to verify that trust. Like, can they actually feel that they feel that you can be trusted with this commercial stuff? Because this is important, right? That commercial stuff can be existential to your business. Get it wrong, company goes out of business. So it is really important. One of the other reasons it's, this trust thing is really important is the statistic here. Um, so Andrew Totally Tokes, who runs the Wellington uh, Product Meetup Group um, and does a bunch of consulting, did a whole pile of research on product leaders. So he's compiled a list of product leaders across the entirety of New Zealand. So VPs, heads of product, chief product officers and whatnot. His statistic is that 60% of those people did not come from a product background. So they were not previously a product manager, product owner, whatever, before stepping into that VP product, head of product, CPO role. That's really high, but also not unusual. Um, I've been talking to some people in the UK. It's about the same there, anecdotally. Same in Australia as well. Um, and that's really interesting because how can that person ex have expectations of what your role should look like if they themselves have not actually done it? Like that's a, it's a really, this really awkward kind of catch-22 situation. So how do we get out of that? So what does your executive team want? Um, so this is um, what you need to know about what your executive team wants, what keeps them up at night? What is the thing that keeps your executive team awake at night? And that can be across the different roles. Might be different across the different roles. The, what keeps the CTO up at night might be different to what keeps the CEO up, up at night. It's a really, really, really important thing to learn. I got this image. It looks like they're all having a seance, but they're not. This is, this is an executive team being kept up at night, honestly. <laughs> And how, you, how does your founder think? I hear a lot of product people ranting on, myself included, and some, some of the, my former team here who, who know what this is all about. Um, your founder has, by definition of the fact that they're the founder, they've been involved since day one. They have spent an awful lot of time thinking about your business. It's probably what they do 24 seven. So how, what are they thinking about? How does their brain work? Understand that, and that enables you to start getting into this kind of commercial side of things. You need to learn how your business makes money. What are all the different levers? I, th I think this is actually a picture of Solar Zero because uh, we have a very, very complicated internal model. I'm still finding new moving parts in the business. But how does your business actually make money? I would strongly encourage anyone who's interviewing um, or being interviewed for a role, ask or be really, really, really clear about how a business makes money before you join. It should be the number one thing that you understand as a product person when you are joining an organization. 
partly because if you don't understand how they make money, how do you know that they're going to be there in one year's time as well, particularly at the moment? Um, so definitely learn that. But it is a key part to, again, learning that, that commercial acumen is that you have to be able to engage with how your business actually makes money. Because if you go and have a conversation with a leader about, um, you know, oh, we absolutely should do X, Y, Z, it's going to do all the stuff, and they go, well, hang on, that's actually not how we make money at all. Remember, coming back to that trust thing, you're immediately going to lose trust with them. What does your exec team not want? Um, they don't want you coming into the boardroom and, and talking to them as if you're an alien and you're on a completely different planet. Um, there's a, a brain principle, the way that our brains work is that we are wired to reject information that doesn't fit the pattern that we expect it to. And this is particularly prevalent in executives. Um, if you come in and go, oh, you know, we absolutely should do this thing. It's the same as if me walking to the room and go, look, the spaceship just landed out there. And you guys are all going to immediately reject what I just said because, you know, of course, the space didn't, you didn't hear it for starters. Aliens aren't charging around the place. Very unexpected. You need to figure out what are you, what is the language of your executive team? What are they expecting to hear? Because if you come in and try and pitch something, you know, a new product, a new revenue stream, something like that, to try and demonstrate that you can be trusted with that commercial stuff, and but you're just like so far off base of their language, or you're talking, you know, if they're, and this, this is one way I've literally saw this play out in real time um, with a, a product person where the exec team were really, really, really concerned about a particular thing and um, something something was going wrong, it was an issue with the product, and that person, the product manager of a particular team, was trying to, they were being a, a good product person, defending the team, defending the capacity of their team. No, 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 we can't look at that. And the executives were like, well, Hank, like, this is the stuff that's scaring us, it's terrifying us. And so that, again, you lose trust. You immediately lose trust in those situations. That's actually the fastest way to lose trust, where you think you're being a good product person and, you know, saying no to things because that's what we do. Um, but if that's something that's really terrifying your executive team, you are going to lose that argument every single time. And it will destroy your trust and it will destroy your ability to be taken seriously commercially in the future. Not all hippos are bad. This was just so that I could put a photo, a picture of a dancing hippo into my presentation. But no, seriously, um, it comes back to what I was saying about the founder before. That founder has been spending an awful lot of time thinking about the business. Not everything that comes out of their mind is the next crazy ass thing that your business needs to do is wrong. You know, we, we, I think as a product community, we've gone a little bit too far to going, we need to resist the hippo. We need to, you know, pet, you know, force them away because founders, they're nasty. Like, they don't know what they're talking about. We're product people. We know what we're talking about. We've done all this discovery. Maybe every so often your founder or your executive team actually are right. And so start from that position. There maybe maybe there's stuff that you don't know. Maybe there's commercial context that you don't know. Maybe it's a, you know again one of those complicated business levers that you just haven't got your head around yet, and that's why it's important. Um, start from that position of going of, of curiosity. Okay, cool. Help me understand the commercials behind that. Help me understand. It enables you to have that kind of conversation. If you start from that default position, hippo bad. Again, you're going to lose that lose that argument every single time. Okay, Gibson Biddle, um, you all must have heard that that statement, you know, how will you delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways? And what I've noticed in terms of discourse in the product community, it's, and this is kind of what Brian Chesky was railing against to some extent and others, has been that we read the first part of that. We go, we need to delight customers. Our role as product people, we, we represent the users, we represent the customers. And we forget about the, the last bit of that and hard to copy margin, money, what uh, Melissa was talking about, margin enhancing ways. That is as important as the delighting of the customers. Aren't making money, you don't have a business. And I'm sorry, but this slide is going to hurt a little bit for everybody because your exec team, customers, money, because that's what sustains your business. This is, if there's one thing I've learned about being an executive, um, your actual responsibility as an executive is to the business first and to your function second. So, you know, for me as chief product officer, my responsibility as an executive team member is firstly making sure that we have a sustainable business, that we can pay our people, that we can keep our customers going. My second responsibility is then as a product person. And that's a real inversing of, of the mindset. You know, I've, I've seen people again really fail, um, particularly more senior product people, forgetting that they're part of the business first 
and their role second. That's really, really, really important. If you're trying to have a conversation with an executive team who are trying to stave off um, the funders or bankruptcy or you know or whatever, um, you know you're never going to be able to have a sensible conversation about the next most amazing feature if that's all they call they care about. Like, it just is not going to work. Find out about that stuff. Um, sometimes execs kind of keep that stuff close. Um, if you are trusted by an executive person, you know, have that coffee with that person, drinks, whatnot. I was talking to a, a, a BA at an event last night, and she was telling me about how you know she's really she's been in this organisation for a long time. She's really close to all the GMs. I'm like, you should you know leverage those relationships to be able to understand commercially how the business works, and that will enable you to build your commercial skills. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm stealing emails. So I'm stealing your slide. They're totally. Um, one of the, the main ways that I've used to sort of start this conversation, in some ways I've actually regretted doing it, is that number of a typical squad, typical group, six, six to nine people over the course of a year, about a million bucks worth of cost. Um, if you do two week sprints, about $50,000 a sprint. That's pretty expensive. You know, what else could you, as a product person, your job is actually not to get your team to do stuff. Your job is to figure out how to earn revenue and earn margin and whatnot and begin to like the customers for your business. So how else could you spend that $50,000? What else could you use with that? And, and also in comparison, if somebody else external, your competitor was going to spend that $50,000, what could they get for their money? Are you operating effectively? Um, the way that I regretted talking about this is that um, in, in organisations who haven't really got their stuff together in terms of internal cost and return on investment and whatnot, um, this was a conversation at, at, at Solar Zero, and, and Zoe there is going to probably remember this one. Um, and that's why I was sort of saying to our CEO, hey, did you know that these squads that we have, they're costing us, well, actually, in our case, probably more than a million dollars a year, more than $50,000 a sprint. What value are we getting from them? He's like, yeah, Anthony, as Chief Product Officer, what value are we getting for them? I'm like, oh, heck, we haven't yet fully aligned on all of that. How do we earn that stuff? Um, but it, it is a really powerful conversation. Um, and it, it really smacks people between the eyes as well. Every time I've had this conversation, particularly with a more junior product owner, they've gone, $50,000, really? You know, you forget that you're responsible for, even if you're responsible for one team, you're responsible for a million dollar spend every year. That's, you know, in my in my book, that's quite a lot of money. More teams multiply a million bucks, numbers add out really fast. Chief product officer responsible for a whole bunch of things, the number's quite scary. So how do we make money? Um, I've shamelessly stolen this slide from uh, the Black Swan Farming website. Uh, Josh Arnold, he's a Kiwi, did a talk on cost of delay last year. It's really good. I was talking to Pioneer about that before. Um, but he, he has this really good model that there are basically four ways that money happens in your business. Is your thing going to increase revenue? Is it going to protect revenue? So not everything is just about adding incremental revenue. It might be protecting revenue, particularly, particularly true in B2B businesses, actually. Is it going to reduce cost? Is it going to avoid cost? Everything you do money-wise is going to fit into one of those buckets. And when you're pitching stuff to your executive team and, again, trying to build that trust about that you're building your commercial acumen, if you can fit into one of those four buckets, that's a good way to start that conversation. What are we doing? What are we trying to do? Why, why do I really, really care about this particular thing? Often as a product person, you have access to a whole bunch of insights. Well, I hope you do. I hope you have access to data. If you don't, you should get it. Do what you can. Find the insights that nobody else has in your business. Um, you know, one way that uh, one of the newer product managers um, in my team really got himself trusted by the rest of the exec team is he he was noodling on some some performance data, um, sales performance data, and we noticed something in terms of the way that our product mix was being sold that we hadn't really seen before. It was something that we kind of knew about, but we went, oh heck, actually. That's a problem right now, and we're about to make some product changes to our pricing structure that meant that it was actually going to become more of a problem if we didn't care about this. And, you know, he and I noodled on this for a bit, and it suddenly became a real topic of conversation within the organization. And so we went from that, you know, just random insight. It came it was a, a by the by of something that he was doing. Um, found that insight and it was a real trust builder in terms of going, yeah, this guy knows his stuff. This guy knows his stuff commercially and can be really trusted with that commercial side of the business. It's also amazing at spreadsheets. Get amazing at spreadsheets. But pick your battles. 
you cannot win every single battle within your organization on trying to build you know, and move into those other areas. You know, if you've got a well-formed strategy team, you're not going to be able to go to your CEO and go, no, I don't think we should have a strategy team. I think I should do that. Um, that's going to be a much, much longer conversation. Find the right moment for that conversation. Um, yeah, you will definitely not win every single battle that you come across. And and be okay with that. It's it's chipping away at it bit by bit by bit, building you know, into those different areas that I showed in that earlier slide slide, chip away at moving into those areas. You won't get there all in one go. So I'm going to set you all an exercise. I want you, after, after this event, sometime in the next week or so, have a bit of a think about in that, that roll scope slide, where do I currently sit? What of those things do I currently do? What are those things would I like to do? What are those things that I feel I would be capable of doing? What are those things I feel I would not be capable of doing? Um, and I'm going to ask for help on those. To, you know, to Melissa's point, um, your business wants you to succeed as a person, as an individual, as a contributor. So it is okay to ask for help about this stuff. Make friends with your finance people. Make friends with your marketing people. They will gladly teach you this stuff to the point they might bore you, but that's another story. <laughs> what keeps my executive team up at night? Do you really have a good handle on that? If you don't, have those coffees, have you know, have those chats over drinks on Friday or however it is that your, your organization socializes. What is keeping them up at night? What are they scared of? Um, and also, if you're not kind of getting that information, how can you have a chat conversation with your leader about how we can share more of that stuff? How can we share more commercial context? I'm, I'm a big fan of being super transparent on commercial stuff with my team, but there's a limit. You know, sometimes the stuff is actually super sensitive and they can't share it, but can your leader share proxies or other ways that you can derive that information and get your head around it? So saying earlier, how do we make money? This is compulsory. Everyone should, every product person should know how the business makes money, regardless of whether or not it's a core part of your role. Find that out. And again, finance people will help you with that. You might have to do that, that scruffy napkin kind of model and circulate that around your organization for them to figure out, you know, to, to work, because they might not know. Like I've, I've literally worked for organizations where how they make money was unclear to everyone. Interesting times. <laughs> and what unique insights can I, as a product person, find that I can present to a leader, a manager, or whatever that's going to start building that trust that, hey, I'm more than just a delivery person? Right, how are we going for time? Oh, excellent, right on 6.40, perfect. Um, so a couple of QR codes there. Um, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, scan that one. Uh, Melissa's got a fantastic, interesting survey there about how um, she could help you. Um, please scan both of them and, and uh, get in touch with us. Um, but with that, we'd like to break for questions. Melissa, when you come on up? Um, Charlie, if you can do microphone running. Um, so just a reminder, if you are online, please put your questions into the chat. And Dapithi is around somewhere. We'll, we'll relay the ones from the chat um, and we'll take questions from the room. All right, let's start with questions in the room. I saw Ryan with his hand up over there. Do you want to start there? So we do need to make sure that we take the microphone around because otherwise the people online and the recording won't hear the question. Yeah, hey, so um, when you had the slide up with sticky notes that was circled around the um, build and then you had the other bigger circle around a whole lot of other things, do all of those, were you saying the this is the business, the commercial acumen for um, product management? My, my question is, aren't a bunch of those going to fit under either product marketing or marketing? as a starter? Yeah, hey, really good question. Um, this comes back to every organization does this differently. Sometimes, and this, you know, this was the, the whole Airbnb discourse, they actually said, right, product managers are going to do product marketing. Um, I'll admit I suck at marketing. <laughs> it's not one of my core skill sets. But as a, as a product person, I'm responsible to make sure that that marketing happens, that we do that go to market. But I happily delegate it out to a really, really smart bunch of product marketers. But I will work with them on what the product pitch is, like help them to really strongly understand how we should position this thing. I've got a rough idea of, in my head of like where this product sits in the market and kind of some of the routes to market. But they'll help me finesse it. Um, yeah, add to that, please. Uh, just to add to that, um, the the Airbnb thing's been really interesting um, because, in a way, product management used to actually include 
the positioning of a product in the market. And in fact, even in some organisations today, I'm thinking telcos, often you'll have a product manager who is responsible for the business casing and um, and in a way the go-to-market for the product. But they lob it over the fence to the product owner and the technical team um, and, the, and you know the product team to get it built without there being much collection back um, in that way, which isn't ideal either. And I think, I think product management recently has moved much more towards almost like an agile model of product ownership and what that means in terms of the smooth delivery of product work. And not and and the, a bit of focus has shifted away from uh, actually how products are positioned in market, the exact words and language that we use um, to customers, um, because what you're creating actually you know needs to meet a need and it needs to meet a need in the way that they think about it, and so um, I think you know product teams have, have got that right from a UX perspective. But the connecting the sort of marketing side of it back into product is is actually I, you know, I think that's a good shift. It's a good shift of the pendulum. Reminded me of a story of a, a friend of mine, somebody um, friends from university. Um, so she was she did a marketing degree, got her first job as a product manager for a stationery company. And so this is very traditional product management because product management isn't new. Like we haven't discovered this stuff recently. Product management has been around since like the 50s and 60s. It's not a new discipline. We've sort of, you know, to, to Melissa's point, we've sort of like reinvented it through Agile. And she kind of, uh, she's funny, she actually did sort of worked as a more sort of traditional FMCG product manager for a while, did some, uh, some, some coding courses and whatnot, and actually moved into being a technology product manager. So, her, you know, now world's sort of kind of aligned. Um, but she still likes to take the piss out of me because when I talk about this stuff as if it's new and unique, she's like, I was doing that stuff like 20 years ago. Like, why, why are you guys as a community only discovering this stuff now? You know, it is a bit of a reversion back to what product management used to be, which was that whole of product responsibility. You know, back in the days when you had physical products and, you know, there was like, multiple aspects to it you know you had to think about how it was built physically how it would sit on a shelf and all that kind of fun stuff hello um just into your point i'm sue from trade me just the questions i ask my team is do you always have to build it because when we're trying to learn something or experiment marketing can learn stuff very quickly and so don't that's why we don't dismiss them we bring them in quite early on some of our discovery work so it's just that's the question we ask ourselves when we kind of think about stuff. Yeah, we, we have a, a wonderful marketing team at, at Solar Zero and um, our, me and our CMO partner very closely because I don't have a user research function. I don't even have a UX people. So um, I work with marketing to do our user research and um, shout out to um, Tracksuit and Ideally. Um, we used Ideally to do some, some market research. Amazing. They were able to turn around these great insights in like 24 hours. Um, and that really helped me. But it was our marketing team who had that hookup with them. She knew exactly how to how to make that work, and so that you know that that research side, partnering with marketing on the research, is really powerful. How does a product manager evaluate the ROI of new features and initiatives, and how do you link to the agile team costs and budgets? How do you evaluate the ROI of a new product or feature? Um, well, so so it comes back to understanding. It's funny we're doing some work on this at the moment. Um, it comes back to understanding first of all what's the business model of your customer. How like what are their um, major pain points? Is it compliance? Is it risk? Is it um, revenue? What stage of growth are they in? Like what's important to them from a strategic perspective, so that you're then able to evaluate whether that is. Um, that is something that they're going to be willing to pay for. And then there's using things like the Van Westendorp. Um, once you've got a mock-up, um, and you know, to your point, you don't have to build it to put it in front of them. It could be a mock-up that you run some price testing with, and you're very quickly going to get a sense of, um, is it something that they, they want to pay for? Um, what was the second part of the question? How do you link to the Agile team's cost and budget? How do you link it? Okay, so so <laughs> well, well, that's why that's one of the reasons why um, 
I, I said, you know, often starting with the team cost for a particular product or, or feature is a good place to start because then you've got, okay, so if we did want to do this, it's going to cost the company $500,000. So that means you, you know that there's going to be an internal rate of return that you're after on that $500,000 IRR. Um, you, uh, so you're going to need to work back from that, go, if we sell this product for, I don't know, a thousand bucks each, how many, how many of those widgets are we going to need to sell in order to get to the level of margin we're looking for on, the, on what we thought we would spend on the team? I think to add to that, a really good point about starting with that team cost. Start with that, we're $50,000 in a hole. How do we get ourselves out of that hole? And, you know, start with a scrappy, you know, some scrappy ideas, just model some stuff, you know, throw some random ideas out there. Talk to your finance team about how it connects to your pricing or, you know, your um, volumes and all that kind of stuff. But just start, like that's the thing. Don't, don't be afraid. Just have a go at it. Have a chat with your CEO, have a chat with your marketing team, validate your ideas and whatnot. But, but always start with that, right, with $50,000 in the hole, how do we get up out of that $50,000? Um, one other thing um, I've personally been involved in um, for an organisation I was going to do previously was doing their RDTI um, returns, so the Government Research and Development Tax Incentive stuff. That's one way to get out of the hole. I can, I can defray 15% or I can get a, a refund on 15% of my um, development cost. So now I'm spending $50,000. If, if I can qualify this for RDTI, I'm now $50,000 less 15%. So thinking about that, how else am I going to fund this? Where else can I get that that money from to to build this thing to get me you know, reduce the size of that hole? Cool. Oh, and oh, so there was a question there about connect to the agile that that connect to the agile team as well. Um, another talk that I do, and I've always had this question from people. Yeah, but my developers just want to write code; they don't care about the stuff. You're going to have to find a way to make them care, or just to be really blunt make them consider that maybe your organization is not the right one for them to work for. I've really got to the point where I do not want to work with a developer who does not have some engagement with the business and how we make money and how we do stuff because you're just constantly pushing back against their resistance, reluctance to think about things through a customer lens. Not only the, you know, how do we actually get them to understand value, but even just thinking about things through a customer lens. Developers are really, really, really smart if they don't know what the outcome is, both from a value and a customer perspective, they'll figure it, they'll have it in their head and it may or may not be the same as yours. I don't know that I want to work with those people. And then they're going to be ultimately dangerous to your organization. Have a really good conversation, a really good heart to heart with your CTO or your equivalent engineering peer about that because you know you need to find ways to get your team to engage with this, regardless of what background they come from. So, uh, you know, just a quick question on, uh, uh, you know, the teams that you talked about, product team, engineering team, development team, you know, they are different, uh, I would say, uh, names to the teams. But, you know, uh, on a nutshell, you have two things. One is focusing on the business. One is trying to execute that in, you know, in in, in a real physical form. So, uh, uh, you know, can you put some light on, you know, whether these two verticals should be merged into a single thought process? or uh, you know they should be run independently uh, because uh, you know uh, it, it it can be a possibility like you know you're not funding uh, the whole team for from that particular product but there might be some other products in that particular organization that needs to be developed so just wanted to have an understanding because you know sometimes we have different verticals sometimes we try to merge those teams so some some thought process on 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 that if I have, can I play your question back to you? So, have, um, do you mean should you get the entire team thinking about uh, sort of the commercial impact that their product decisions are going to make? Is that? Uh, you know what happens is uh, the engineering team they have a different mindset altogether. They try to think from a perspective. Uh, you know they need to release another version of of the uh, you know current version that they're working upon. But the business try to focus on the you know the business the customer requirements. So how to you know mitigate that gap? Uh, so they could be under one umbrella or they could be in yeah. umbrella. 
Look, I, I think this is actually one of the tremendously difficult things about the product management role, because if you think back to that Venn diagram, um, business, UX and technology, actually there is craft and, and let's call it epistemologies or sources of knowledge in each one of those areas that requires mastery in each one of those areas. And I think sometimes product managers can get a little bit too caught up in the, it has to delight customers, when that's actually, that's the job of the designers. And the product manager's role is to make sure that each one of those craft functions, including the business craft, is um, amalgamating in a beautiful way right in the centre of that Venn diagram. It's not an easy job. I have a whole talk dedicated to, to a sort of related topic, which I call how to create product teams that don't suck. Um, and why I use that term don't suck is that if we're not all pulling in the same direction towards the same objective, if tech is pulling towards tech objectives and you're trying to pull towards a product objective, that is going to suck. You need to create that real cross-functional grouping of everyone pulling towards a customer outcome. It's part of what I was talking about earlier about customer uh, organizations being truly customer centric only if their organization is truly in service of the customer and that's where you start to get into like value stream thinking and things like that um, and as a product manager if your organization is not structured that way it really hurts like it is really hard if you know if your engineers have got one set of incentives and they're different to your incentives it's a really 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 tough place to be you have to have some serious existential conversations in your organization. Um, and also just picking up a point there around engineering wanting to do, you know, engineering tech debt and that kind of stuff. That has business value as well. And one of your one of your other jobs as a product manager is to help your engineering teams, your CTO, whatever your, your peers are there, help them translate stuff around tech debt into business value. Tech debt always has business value. That engineer who's like going, oh my God, we need to fix this piece of tech debt. They're not doing that because for giggles, like they're doing that because they genuinely feel that's a problem, but they may not be able to express it in business terms. I've had lots of amazing conversations with business, with uh, engineers and un help them to unpack that and convert it into a piece of business value. Maybe it's about velocity. Maybe it's about going faster. Maybe it's about our engineering team not leaving because they hate our product and the cost associated with that. Um, you know, help them translate. And then that then what you're doing there is you're getting everybody into a common language of your executive team, that money language. If you can bring that common language together, now we start to pull, start to pull in the same direction. Yeah. Our, uh, I think you know way up, uh, and and you know trying to address what we're trying to achieve. You know, as a let's say a next version or something new needs to be added to you know to the current version. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that comes down to alignment activities in an organisation, and so um, you would hopefully have a leadership team that might not be your executive team, but sort of the next level of leadership team meeting on a regular basis so that they are actually evaluating the possible um, set of initiatives and making some decisions about what's going to drive the most impact. Um, I thought I was going to have way too many slides, so I, I kicked one of them out, which, um, which I thought was a spicy hot take, which is I think people should abandon rice as a prioritisation method. <laughs> And one of the reasons for that is that often people who are using rice don't necessarily have enough acumen to know what reach and impact actually means and how to evaluate that. And so it becomes quite subjective. Um, and my favourite way of prioritising is actually working with the team and, um, and having the team work with the leadership team to really define what value drivers are important for the business this year right now and then um, get the exec team to weight those value drivers and then score them, um, plus a cost of delay divided by effort. And, um, and actually, if, you've, if you have um, made your prioritisation scoring method specific to your particular business, then, you know, the stack rank you get is, makes a lot more sense. Yeah, 
Yeah, and, and don't underestimate the amount of time it takes in alignment activities and the number of communication artefacts that you might need to be creating in order to create that alignment. Let's just take another question from you. What are the top three metrics that can persuade your exec uh, executive team to build something? Sorry, what are the what metrics? Top three metrics. Top three metrics to convince your executive team to build something. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm working in startups at the moment, so uh, new MRR that drives ARR, really critical. Um, uh, things that will lift ARPA, average revenue per account or user, ARPU, um, probably two major metrics. And then the other thing to be thinking about, um, particularly in tough tech times like this, is operational efficiency so margin like you know if you can if you if you have a tech team that spends a month on doing something that speeds your team up and enables you to ship features even faster then that might be a piece of platform work that the exec team will say yes to I... um, MRR and ARR driving initiatives so monthly recurring revenue that drives annual recurring revenue. Yeah, there's quite quite a few of those um, sort of money related terms that's worth reading up on. We did, did a talk a few years ago around sort of the, the sort of the SAS, fun, um, SAS economics fundamentals. It's well worth reading up on those terms. Um, my answer to that question actually is really simple: money, money, and money. <laughs> Um, I mean, and that kind of is at the heart of, of what Melissa was talking about. It is the core financials of your business, um, but also things like um, you know something that's going to make your founder look amazing and get them and get them in the media. Uh, that can be it's a good consideration as well. But no, seriously, a, a lot of it, particularly at the moment, comes back to those core financials. How are we going to? Earn money, save money, avoid cost, recover cost. You know the the slide that I put up before. Those are those really key metrics. They, they will have different names depending on the nature of the business that you're in, but that's kind of what it comes back to. Another question from the room. Hello, and thank you for the talk. So you spoke earlier about when engineers have like a different incentive in mind to what the product manager might have in mind, or maybe they're not across the same problem. So my question is actually around the flip side. So I've got a few engineers on my team and they are amazing. Um, oh my God, they are a blast to work with. They like, not only do they spend time looking at data with me, helping me get the data I need, but they also really engage with all the interviews I share. They like ask good questions about it. They get really excited. Oh my God, that's lit. Like I love that shit so much. Um, and I want to celebrate them. So how, what's a good way of showing them like that I really appreciate this, that it does matter, it does make a difference um, beyond just sort of, you know, measuring success of the work and reporting that back to the team. Thanks. I want, I want to work with your team. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the kind of team I've had so much fun working with when they really engage with that. Um, the way that I deal with it is give them the limelight. Let them talk. Give, put, put, you know, bring them to your executive team to present. Let them gain that exposure. You know, it's not. And this is something as, as we forget as product people. Like, it's not about us. We're just enablers for our teams. And so, you know, help them get the exposure within the organisation. Maybe they want to move into product in the future. Give them some of your work. <laughs> um, let, you know, let them pick up some of that stuff because that might be why they're showing that engagement because they actually they, they, that's the stuff that they might find fun along with the core sort of engineering tasks. That's completely awesome, and um, and uh, you know I have to say I think a, a lot of the engineers that I've worked with in my career are actually incredibly analytical people who want to know that they're working on products that are going to be successful commercially as well as for customers. So I think, you know, again it comes back to, for me I think it's actually about creating a learning community in the team that you are working in and in the neighbourhood around your team, um, and. You know, when you when you sort of openly start having those kinds of conversations, then um, that becomes rewarding in and of itself. Another question online. Uh, question to Melissa: What do you miss about UX? <laughs> Good question. Um, I am a massive. So, despite the fact that my whole talk was about financials, I'm a massive word geek, and um, what I loved about UX. Um, 
back in the day when we were still called information architects. I don't know how many people are old enough in the room to remember that. I know. Um, uh, was I actually loved the process of um, writing labels and clustering information and grouping it into, um, yeah, groups that made sense and giving them words that meant something. Yeah. How would you quantify protecting revenue? I think uh, they they are uh, mentioning the four value drivers you mentioned before. So in context to that. Yeah, good question. So protecting revenue is, um, those are all of your customer retention features, right? So um, quite often product leadership um, folks will have to make trade-offs or decisions between do we build this new thing that's going to drive new MRR or do we um, do we pour some oil on some squeaky wheels that are driving a lot of customer support tickets or um, that customers are complaining about and might be impacting on our NPS surveys. And, and uh, the answer is it depends kind of what strategic season you're in at the moment, but you should pretty much always be trying to sprinkle some customer retention improvements through the product on a fairly regular basis. Um, I like to do seasons because um, one thing I've noticed with um, when you've got product teams and is that if you're trying to do too many things that are different in the same sort of time period, it can get really confusing. So I quite like to do seasons, quarterly seasons, where you might have one season that's on new MRR growth, you might have another season that's about refactoring or, you know, um, uh, addressing feature requests and, you know, that type of thing. And, and it's really about customer attention. To, to riff on um, on that for a moment, it comes back to what I was talking about, about what keeps your executive team up at night and then how do we make money? What is the operating mode for your business right now? Are you in growth mode where it's all about acquisition and maybe a leaky retention bucket is kind of okay? And so if you're going to go and rant about, oh my God, we need to fix this retention thing, but actually your executive is purely focused on that acquisition side, tough conversation to have. You know, you, you, you've missed the point about the operating mode of your organization, um, but also helping your, ex helping your leadership to understand that it needs to be a balance. You can't just acquire, 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 because sooner or later that bucket gets too leaky and now you've got a bigger problem. The other thing I wanted to, to pick up on, on the protecting revenue side, I know we have a lot of B2B organizations in New Zealand. This is really hard in a B2B organization because if we do, particularly for like, so you've got a five-year contract or a seven-year contract um, with uh, uh, you know, organizations that are buying your stuff. Um, if you don't fix this thing, that customer is not going to leave you tomorrow. And if you don't fix this other thing, they're not going to leave you tomorrow as well. But sooner or later, you're going to hit that friction point that come renewal time, you're going to have a really, really, really tough time. And that means that 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 change is, has an indirect effect on revenue. And so there's, you start to deal with probabilities. You know, can you model that probabilistically that if we fix this thing, it's going to be, you know, that customer's worth, worth a million bucks a year to us. Um, that maybe increases their chance of churning by, um, you know, 1% or something like that. 1% multiplied by a million dollars equals this value. You can create those like proxy values for it. But in B2B, it's actually it, protecting that protecting revenue model, particularly for organizations with a small number of high value customers. It is actually really hard and you do have to kind of like create proxies for it. Oh, oh sorry, just grab, grab the microphone so the people online can hear you. Uh, a quick question on, uh, you know, let's say there is one, uh, I would say, strategy that has worked for me, that is, you know, water cooler talks uh, with uh, engineering folks or, you know, other product guys uh, in the organization. Any such tips that you have, you know, tried that is not, you know, uh, booked somewhere, but, you know, that has worked wonders for you that you would like to share from your experience that has, you know, uh, open gates for other product discoveries, you know, uh, let's say, you know, cross portfolio kind of thing. And, you know, uh, you're you're trying to get some revenue. Uh, you know, just trying to mix those two products and something of that sort. So, good question. Um, data, faffing about with data. Spend some time. You know, set aside an afternoon, maybe a Friday afternoon. Pull a whole bunch of data together, and just have a bit of a play. Like, just start put some scenarios together. You'd be amazed at what emerges from that. And you go, 
oh my God, how did I not see that before? Like, you know, said that, you know, what it was talking, that example I was citing earlier, like, how do we, how do we not see that before? Why are we not caring about that stuff? Just you know, grabbing some data, having a bit of a play, particularly with um, some of the new tools, uh, you know, ChatGPT, Copilot tools, you can now analyze very quickly, not having to become like a data scientist, analyze and find patterns at scale that we couldn't do before for an, an, you know, an idiot human, like a product manager, like you don't have to learn all those data science tools to be able to do that. So yeah, just have a bit of a play with some data. But if you're in ChatGPT, make sure that you've got training data turned off. <laughs> Thank you very much for the talk. One thing, uh, like we, what we are talking, if the organization is product led or we are building some product, there are organizations that, you know, they are working on traditional way of things, right? There are different departments, they are working. So bringing team who are supporting the operational work, right? How do we bring a commercial acumen to these people? Like I am working with a team which is just making a technology support for a application that are running within the organization, not directly interacting with the customer. We are having a customer base. So how do we bring commercial acumen to these people? So um, if you feel it's important that they come on that journey with you, then, um, then back to my learning in the open um, uh, slide, you, if you uh, create an, a conversation. You say, we're going to do some lunch and learns, brown paper bag sessions. We want everybody to kind of get familiar with these concepts. And you actually create a learning community in the in the company. Then people can kind of, um, and, and you're making sure they understand it's a kind of safe space and there's no dumb questions. Then, then actually you can um, find somebody in the business who's motivated to come and share some of their knowledge um, with that group. Um, I talked about Gordon, the strategic finance guy at TVNZ. He was so chuffed to be asked to create a mini course for the product managers. And um, and those PMs just, you know, they, they really lifted their game after that. Not that they weren't fantastic in the first place, but they were able to um, have a different kind of conversation with their stakeholders. Okay, one more question, Marie. Oh, yeah. Straightforward question. So you have a meme when you say that don't worry about the client, just worry about the, the money, right? When we are creating a new product, don't you think that if you worry more about the client, what the client wants, and the money will come, the money will flow? What do you think about that? I think this is such an interesting tension because if you're introducing a new product to market, quite often... Um, and, and let's say the exec team want um, revenue from it pretty quickly, and you start with revenue as your metric, then you're probably going to come unstuck. And the reason for that is, um, if you remember the business model stage um, slide that I showed, if you are only at problem solution fit, which means you're figuring out what the customer problem is and you're coming up with solutions, but you haven't started testing that yet, and so you don't have product market fit yet. Um, and you try and put revenue on it when you don't actually know if customers want it, um, then that's going to come unstuck, or it might come unstuck. And so the thing to be measuring first in that scenario is traction metrics. So um, how many customers can we get on in a certain time period onto this new product as an indicator that the market wants it? and that it's worthwhile doubling down and spending some more money on it. And so, uh, so um, driving customer acquisition, for instance, um, would be the metric that the, that the company should be focusing on at that point. I, I was being slightly facetious with that, that slide. Um, but I, I will absolutely guarantee that every single person in this room over the next 12 months will have a conversation with their exec or their manager or their leader that will go something along the lines of, hey, we need to do this. That's going to actively harm our users. You know that, right? No, 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 no. We need the revenue. Yeah, but it's going to hurt our users. Bad news, your job is to unpick that conversation <laughs> and it's not going to be easy. And what, I'm, what I was trying to encourage with that slide is that it's not always about the users. You do have to think about that money side as well because it's no good saying that, um, you know, we have to do the right thing for our customers if we go out of business. Like that, that doesn't help, doesn't help the customers either. 
But you're exactly right that the reverse is also true, that if we do something that actually actively harms our customers, it's going to then reduce our revenue. So it is a tension. There's no right or wrong answer in there. But it's about you having, as a product person, having empathy for that person who's trying to have that money conversation with you and not just resisting, no, 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 it's always about the customer actually being able to have empathy for them in the same way that you have empathy for your UX teams who are trying to make sure that you do the right thing by the customer. You have to have that empathy on both sides.